What does it take to be a good military leader? When everything is on the line, it is often charisma, tactical sagacity, tenacity, timing, and a heap of cunning that mark one out. At times, it can come down to the simple refusal to quit when all others around have raised the white flag. In the history of Britain, there have been many such men. Among them, Karatakos stands, glimmering like a distant star from near the beginning of recorded British history. Though often overshadowed by the more popularized Boudicca, the role of Karatakos in the war against Rome was in reality more significant and far longer lasting. He went from being one of the most powerful kings of the island to a rootless rebel taking up residence with whatever tribe would agree to stand with him and his band against Rome. This is the story of that rebel king, the man who refused to kneel, his decade-long battle against the invasion of his lands, his cunning bravery and betrayal, a true legend of Britain. Hi friends, I'm Kevin McLean. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and consider supporting the channel through Patreon or PayPal. Much thanks to all of my supporters. Though the invasion of Britain by Julius Caesar between 55 and 54 BC ultimately ended in what might be called a failure, the general portrayed it back home as a victory with Casavallanus said to have surrendered and offered hostages and annual tribute. According to a note from Caesar to Cicero, he obtained no loot from Britain. There is also no record of the amounts of annual tribute being received from Britain, though it's possible that tribute was given. Yet the invasion attempt and the conquest of their cousins just across the channel could not but have had a dramatic effect on the tribal politics of Britain. The main figure who had led the fight against Caesar, Casovolanus, made a dramatic impact on the British consciousness, so much so that his name survived into medieval Welsh legends. In some, he was the son of a god, or equated to a god. In the triads of Britain, he is said to have been one of the three golden shoemakers, he strove against Caesar for the love of Flur and snuck into Rome disguised as a shoemaker. Lle and Gwydion, Welsh gods, are also some of the three golden shoemakers and they also disguise themselves as shoemakers. Lle's wife is Blodaiwith, meaning flower face. There would appear to be a complete overlap of themes. According to Welsh genealogical text, Tasciovanus became king of the Catovalani tribe. While the specifics are not certain, Tasciovanus was a real king that ruled after Casovalanus, as he minted several different coins bearing his name and may have expanded Catovalani power over former regions of the Trinovantes, most importantly Camulodunum. He was succeeded by another famous king who enters early British history, Cunobelin, one of several of his sons, and it was Cunobelin who was father of Caratacus. The historian Suetonius, writing nearly a hundred years later, called Cunobelin the king of the Britons. This was an exaggeration, at least in part for he had only direct rule over southeastern Britain in the region of the Catovalani and the Trinovantes. He does, however, appear to have been the most powerful king known in Britain at that time, and it's possible that he held some type of sacerdotal leadership over the other tribes, at least in southern Britain. Much like the office of the High King in Ireland, while the High King might not have controlled the entire territory, he was nonetheless seen as a symbolic sovereign, with a religious as well as political role. In contrast to what was soon to come, Cuno Belen had good relations with Rome. There was increased trade with the Empire, and some of his coins included Roman motifs, Roman depictions of gods, and even Roman titles like Rex, meaning king, 
Some have suggested he was a client king of Rome. It is possible, but if so, this relationship was not to last. Cunobelin had three sons, Togodunus, Adminius, and Caratacus. Tacitus implies that there may have been other sons that we do not know from our sources. Cunobelin also had a brother, Epaticus, who was an accomplished warrior who won control over the Atrabatian capital of Kaleva, roughly modern-day Silchester. It was Caratacus who rose up to take over his uncle's role. While we do not know much about the early lives of these three brothers, we might venture some guesses. That Cunobelin was seen as a client king of Rome seems supported by Roman sources and some of his coins. Yet from an early age his sons are given important political positions. Caratacus and Togudumnus may have been responsible for the flight of their brother, and it may be that the friendly relations with Rome were a front to a larger ambition on the part of Cunobelin, to buy time in order to expand their power, in order to resist direct Roman control they likely saw on the horizon. With Gaul just to the south, it didn't take a military strategist to see what was likely to be the fate of Britain. His son Adminius, the Black Sheep, does not appear to have favored the notion of defiance, instead running to the arms of Rome. Roman historian Suetonius reports that Adminius went over to the Romans with a close cohort of men, requesting that Rome aid him in casting out his father and installing him as king over all Britain. A haughty demand, surely, yet there is some indication that his request did not fall on deaf ears. Caligula was the emperor at that time, and this episode led to his infamous march against the sea. It is claimed that Caligula intended to invade Britain, and, as Adminius requested, that the troops were all drawn up and that they marched north to Lugdunum Batavorum. I have suggested that this act, presented as the actions of a madman by Roman historians, may have been related to a Gaulish ritual. But whatever the truth, Caligula did not end up crossing the channel, dashing Adminius's hopes. Yet Caligula's rule was not long, the victim of assassination, and soon there was another emperor looking to make a name for himself through military conquest, Tiberius Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. He set his sights on Britain, just after becoming emperor. Back in Britain, Caratacus and his brother Togudomus were heating things up. They gained control over the Atrobates, and Verica, the king, fled to Rome, requesting Claudius' aid to help strike back at the Catovolani. Interestingly, Roman historian Dio Cassius says that Verica was overthrown in a rebellion, but this was ultimately blamed on the two Catovolani kings. As Verica was a very open client king of Rome, it is possible that an anti-Roman sentiment was building up among the tribes whose nobility was affronted by the prospect of paying tribute to the empire, and that Caratacus and Togodumnus were in some way leading or organizing that sentiment which led to Verica's overthrow. The Catovolani kings appear to play an important role in the affairs of other tribes, and it is also to them that the other tribes rally when the time comes to fight the invaders making it very possible that they held a role similar to the High Kings of Ireland. Since the invasion of Julius Caesar, the Catovolani are shown to be the main organizers and defenders of the land, able to unite tribes under them to do battle against outside threats. Under Cunobelin and his sons, they were rapidly expanding their tangible power. They would have known that in order to stand on equal footing with Rome, they needed to unite. They had removed their pro-Roman brother. They either overthrew or were behind the overthrow of a Roman client king. And from their new power base in Camulodunum, they were increasing their military force. 
Rome saw an opportunity, but they also recognized a growing challenge that if left unchecked might become a serious problem. Suetonius records that Britain was in rebellion, refusing to pay tribute because of the Roman refusal to return certain fugitives. The fugitive implied may have been Verica, Adminius, or both, though the demand may also have been an excuse. Refusal to pay the tribute was a gamble, but likely one they had to take. While we don't know exactly how much tribute was being extracted from Britain, but it was said that Britain supplied more tribute than would have been possible to extract through taxation if the island was invaded. If true, it was likely an extraordinary burden upon the nobles and common people alike that was helping to fuel anti-Roman sentiment, much as it did in Germania during the same period. With the dispossession of the Atrobates providing his justification, Claudius, urged on by General Aulus Platius, prepared to launch a full-scale invasion of Britain. It is unknown exactly how many troops he used, but there were likely four legions involved, the 2nd Augusta, the 9th Hispania, the 14th Gemina, and the 20th Valeria Victrix, plus at least 20,000 auxiliaries. War elephants were also brought by Claudius, and shipped across the channel, which must have been quite a shock for native Britons. Large, sturdy ships were constructed specifically for the purpose of the channel crossing, recalling the trouble that Julius Caesar had encountered and wishing to leave little to fate or the weather. Perhaps even as Claudius made preparations for the invasion, the great king Cunobelin, father of Caratacus, departed to the other world. It is thought that the great burial mound near Colchester may belong to him, built by Caratacus and Togodomnus. It isn't certain which brother became king, they may have shared power between them, but in either case they worked closely together to face the massive challenge that now crept towards them. Sometime during the mourning of their father, they received word through their contacts in Gaul that Rome was on the move, with its sights set on Britain, and them in particular. Gathering their men and solidifying the other tribes of Britain behind their lead, they prepared for the most difficult battle of their lives. It was in the summer of 43 AD that Claudius' forces crossed the channel. The emperor did not join the initial assault, but left the grueling work to Aulus Platius, the Roman general who had helped push for the invasion, as well as the future emperor Vespasian and his brother, they sent their best, clearly expecting tough resistance. They may have landed in Rutupii, known as Richborough Castle today. The British forces led by Togodomnus and Karatakos would have been unlikely to know where or exactly when the Romans were to land though they would certainly have known what was coming. Warriors from nearby tribes flocked to their banners in the lead up to the invasion, along with supplies. Slings, javelins, spears, short swords were common in their ranks, and they drew upon large numbers of chariots. Roman writers commented that one of the particular feats that British warriors would practice was walking out upon the yoke of the chariot while it was being driven taking great dexterity. It is also a feat ascribed to heroic figures in Irish tales. Perhaps Caratacus and his brother put on such daring displays before the hosts to enliven their courage as they tensely awaited the arrival of the Roman troops. After Roman forces landed, scouts would have raced down the many narrow chariot paths to bring word to the Catavolani kings of their position, number, and general course. It was decided that they would mass their forces at the river crossing probably near Rochester, Kent, along the river Medway. In the meantime, forces were deployed to skirmish with and harass the advancing Roman legions, being sure to fall back and draw them onward to the desired site for the main event. 
The British had set up their position on the far side of the river, and it was expected that the Romans would have difficulty with the crossing, leaving them vulnerable while they attempted the ford. They hadn't counted on crack Celtic troops able to swim the river, even in their full armor. The Celts crossed, surprising the British forces, and they set about attacking the chariot force, causing disarray which gave the rest of the Roman troops time to attempt the ford. Yet the forces under Caratacus and Togodomnus were able to check the Romans for the entire day, holding them in a stalemate. The second day saw bitter fighting on both sides, with British forces nearly overrunning and capturing Gnaeus Hosidius Geta, a Roman senator and general. Yet in the end, Geta was able to turn the battle around decidedly, resulting in the British forces falling back to the Thames after the day's fighting, which saw many casualties on both sides. Geta's turning of the battle was so stunning that he was awarded a Roman triumph, despite not even being of the rank of consular, something unprecedented. Though the details of the battle do not survive, it should be assumed that he was responsible for reversing a potential Roman defeat. That the British forces of Caratacus and Togodomnus were able to meet the Roman invasion force in direct battle and sustain intense fighting for several days without breaking, fighting on equal footing and strategically retreating to a better location, speaks to discipline and preparation among the British forces. These were not barbarian troops fighting heedlessly, as perhaps was the case with the Iceni rebellion later, but patient and calculating experienced warriors. Both places of battle were well chosen by the Catavolani kings, and the edge which the Romans held in the contest appears to have been not their superior tactics, but their armor. Tactically, Caratacus and Togudomnus did everything right in their first major engagement against a juggernaut, Rome. The British forces cross the Thames somewhere near where it enters the sea. The battle at this site was not well recorded, but it appears that the Britons attempted to hold the far side of the river as they did previously, assailing those who came across. The Romans became bogged down here and lost many men in their attempt to cross the river, and there was vicious fighting at the ford. Yet here again the Roman Celtic auxiliary troops proved pivotal to Roman success. One group fords the river easily in their armor, swimming across, while another group quickly traveled to the west where a small bridge was located. Togodomnus and Caratacus, busy holding down the Roman legions, then found themselves beset by Celts on all sides. At some point in the battle, Togudomnus is hit. Perhaps it was a javelin cast as he ordered his men to retreat. Maybe a sword thrust as he dueled one of the Celts who had encircled them. Whatever it was, he was injured badly. Overrun by Celts, the British retreated to the safety of the swamps, and as the Celtic forces tried to pursue them, they found that the swamp was something far different than the river ford. The local British knew the trackways through it, but those who eagerly pursued them soon found themselves the ones who were hunted. Many Roman Celts never found their way out of that swamp. Though they had lost many men, the forces of Togodomnus and Caratacus remained intact. Sequestered in the safety of the swamps, they had time to see to their wounded. Togodomnus, though he had managed to escape, was quickly succumbing to his injuries. Perhaps with Kenotakos at his side, he gave his last words to his brother before closing his eyes for the last time. With his brother gone, the fate of his people and Britain lay heavily upon him. Yet it was a weight he bore without kneeling, though the situation now looked bleak. Together with his closest comrades, he planned what their next move was to be. They may have headed back to Camelodunum at this point, though the sources are not clear. General Plotius held his troops back at the Thames, feeling cautious after their close calls 
and the losses at the river crossings and in the swamps. He awaited for the reinforcements that were coming along with Emperor Claudius. War elephants and siege equipment likely intended to awe the population into surrender and also to besiege the capital, Camulodunum. Back in the Catovolani stronghold, there was likely some very hard conversations taking place. Various tribes may have recalled their men, already intending to surrender. The Iceni to the north, if they ever lent troops, were now vowing to be loyal Roman allies, yet Caratacus would not hear it. With passion and indignation, he stirred the people once more to resist. They, as free men, could not forever endure the yoke of slavery, nor be disarmed or made to kneel before foreigners in their own lands. Vowing to avenge his brother's death, Caratacus gathered his diminished forces and prepared for yet another battle, this time with Emperor Claudius himself. Some historians believe the battle never took place, but Cassius Dio says that when Emperor Claudius arrived with his reinforcements, including war elephants, the enemy had amassed again on the far side of the river. A pitched battle was fought, but the forces of Caratacus were routed. Yet the king of the Catovolani escaped, along with his core group of men, which may have included other brothers unnamed in history. With the main organized opposition defeated, Emperor Claudius and his elephants marched to Camulodunum, modern Colchester, and there received the surrender of the eleven tribes that had supported Caratacus in his struggle against the imperial power. In most tales, this would be the end, but not this one. Caratacus had vowed not to give up the fight, and he didn't. After retreating with his forces, he seems to have went west, probably going from tribe to tribe, attempting to build up an alliance against the invasion force with those tribes who had not yet surrendered to Rome. He found welcome arms in modern-day Wales, and became war leader of the Siliures and the Ordovasis. The two tribes generally corresponding to South and North Wales, respectively, from his wild mountain strongholds, he waged guerrilla war upon Roman forces for almost a decade, leading nighttime raids, hit and run strikes, aiding tribes resisting the Romans, and acting much in the character of later British figures like Robin Hood, and more exactly like Owain Glyndwr, who would later take up the same tactics against the English from the exact same region. The actions of Keratakos made him a very famous and popular figure in Britain. Legends of him survive in Welsh mythology, and gods like Llei and Gwydion are said to be his descendants in medieval genealogies. Geoffrey of Monmouth called him Arviragos, son of Kimbelinus, and he appears in Shakespeare as well, where an interesting mythological tale is spun about him that seems to take elements from earlier pagan myths. He and his brother, Guiderius, were kidnapped by Belerius, an enemy of his father, but were trained by him and treated as his sons. In Welsh versions of Joffrey's history, he and his brother are called Gwerith and Gwydir. Finally, he is also represented as Caradog, son of Bran, Bran being Bendigaedvran, legendary king of Britain and a god. Caradog is the Middle Welsh rendition of the name Caratacus. But Caratacus was not only making a name for himself at home, his fame was reportedly spreading widely as a heroic and unrelenting warrior who used his daring and cunning to outwit a much more powerful foe and one who refused to be captured or surrender. Tacitus says that even in Rome, he was celebrated as a hero, despite being one of their most enduring enemies. Caratacus must have been quite a character to inspire such feelings even in Rome. In 50 AD, somewhere in the mountains of North Wales, in the lands of the Ordovasi, 
Caratacus arranged to fight a decisive battle against the Roman general Scapula. In his ranks were men from various tribes who wished to resist the might of Rome and had flocked to his banner of defiance. He had chosen a well-fortified position, as he always did, and Tacitus says that he flew hither and thither, protesting that that day and that battle would be the beginning of the recovery of their freedom or of everlasting bondage. He appealed by name to their forefathers who had driven back the dictator Caesar, by whose valor they were free from the Roman acts and tribute and still preserved the persons of their wives and their children. While he was thus speaking, the host shouted applause. Every warrior bound himself by his national oath not to shrink from weapons or wounds. The location of the battle is disputed, but though Karatakus had carefully picked a fortified location to gain every tactical advantage, his forces were defeated. As before, the defeat seems less to do with bad tactics or even training or discipline of the troops, and more to do with a lack of equipment. Even Tacitus makes reference to this saying, quote, As long as it was a fight with missiles, the wounds and the slaughter fell chiefly on our soldiers. But when we had formed the military testudo, and the rude, ill-compacted fence of stones was torn down, and it was an equal hand-to-hand -hand engagement, the barbarians retreated to the heights. Yet even there, both light and heavy-armed soldiers rushed to attack. The first harassed the foe with missiles, while the latter closed with them, and the opposing ranks of the Britons were broken, destitute as they were, of the defense of breastplates or helmets. Tacitus says the Britons fought better than the Roman forces at a distance, but when the Romans were able to close on them, the lack of armor of the British forces proved their primary weakness and ultimately the reason for their defeat. Yet despite this loss and the capture of his wife, daughter, and unnamed brothers, Karatakus of the many wiles manages to slip through the fingers of Rome yet again escaping into the wilds. He fled north, entering the lands of the Brigantes. They were nominal allies of Rome, but a great number of the people were rebel sympathizers, including the former husband of Queen Cartamandua, Venutius. Caratacus sought to recruit troops, or at least obtain sanctuary. Instead, Cartamandua had her soldiers seize him and throw him in chains. In exchange for wealth and the increased support of Rome, Queen Cartamandua handed Caratacus over to the Romans. After this act of treachery, she never again held the respect of her people. Two rebellions were staged against her, led by her ex-husband Venutius. In the first, she maintained power only through the direct military intervention of Roman troops and auxiliaries. The second time, she was not so fortunate escaping to Roman-held territories, but never again returning to the lands of the Brigantes. One of the reasons cited for her overthrow was her treachery against Caratacus. With the rebel king finally captured, Claudius held a great spectacle in Rome, with the main exhibit being Caratacus, his wife, daughter, and brothers. Tacitus says, Nine years after the beginning of the war in Britain, his fame had spread thence, and traveled to the neighboring islands and provinces, and was actually celebrated in Italy. All were eager to see the great man who, for so many years, had defied our power. Even at Rome, the name of Caratacus was no obscure one. It was an amazing feat for a man to gain such fame across such a wide area of Europe in under a decade with many years of that time spent fighting from the mountains of Wales. His many deeds from the time of his defeat upon the ford and the death of his brother Togodomnus were likely seen as heroic and romantic, and in Welsh myth he appears to have been transformed into an almost divine figure. That he was even thought of as a folk hero in Italy 
speaks to just how significant a figure he must have been, and the number of word-of-mouth tales that were spreading about him, presenting him likely as a type of Robin Hood. This favor that Caratacus had in Rome was not confined only to the plebeians, however, for a strange, almost unheard-of thing happened when Caratacus was brought before Emperor Claudius and situated before the tribunal. While all the others bent down in submission, Caratacus refused to kneel. Instead, standing defiantly, without a trace of humbleness, according to Tacitus, he said, Had my moderation in prosperity been equal to my noble birth and fortune, I should have entered this city as your friend rather than as your captain, and you would not have disdained to receive, under a treaty of peace, a king descended from illustrious ancestors and ruling many nations. My present lot is as glorious to you as it is degrading to myself. I had men and horses, arms and wealth. What wonder if I parted with them reluctantly? If you Romans choose to lord it over the world, does it follow that the world is to accept slavery? Were I to have been at once delivered up to you as a prisoner, Neither my fall nor your triumph would have become famous. My punishment would be followed by oblivion, whereas if you save my life, I shall be an everlasting memorial to your clemency. Claudius, in a remarkable twist, granted this unrepentant warrior and his family their lives. He was apparently given his own residence in Rome by a noble, and lived out the rest of his days there, very likely he was not allowed to return to Britain, or even leave the city. Dio Cassius said that once when he was walking through Rome after having been granted his life, he looked about the grand buildings of the city, the great works of art and architecture, and mused. It is a wonder to me that, possessing such marvels, you still desire our humble huts. The question of Caratacus fits also with his comments recorded by Tacitus, that of trying to understand the Roman imperial mindset, which was somewhat alien to the Britons. Caratacus was indignant that Roman should strive to take what was his. He prized his freedom and the independent destiny of his people. And he was motivated also by that which motivated all the ancient heroes of Greece, immortality. If he had not fought with all that he had, he would have died in obscurity. His death would be oblivion. Through his acts he achieved what he sought. He became an immortal, remembered in myth and history as a great warrior, rebel, and king of Britain. I hope you liked the video, and if you did, please like, subscribe, and consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. Again, much thanks to all of my wonderful supporters. And as always, stand tall.